Good morning, everybody. Um, happy, happy Monday. Um, and welcome to this EPC policy dialogue, which will be focusing on demining and rebuilding EU-Japan cooperation in Ukraine. The key points of today's discussion are going to be shared priorities for Japanese and European security, Japan's engagement with the EU security architecture, and EU-Japan cooperation with Ukraine in reconstruction and demining, where there's opportunity to work further than they are actually today. Since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Japan has been a consistent and reliable partner for Ukraine and also for the EU and other international partners. This has included important political, economic and humanitarian support. Most recently, Japan supported Ukraine with a further 4.5 billion. It also has a very strong sanctions policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and is actively engaged in plans for Ukraine's reconstruction. For example, Japan will be hosting the Japan-Ukraine Conference for Promotion of Economic Reconstruction in 2004. I think in the first, first quarter of the year, but I'm not 100% sure. It also plays a very important part um, in the demining de um, coalition with Japan also having um, a long history of supporting demining activities in various parts of the world. So with that, I would like to introduce our speakers today. First of all, joining us from uh, Tokyo, um, Professor uh, Chiyuki Eyo, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, Professor of International Security at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University um, of Tokyo. Uh, Timothy Milovano, who is the president of the Kiev School of Economics. Jo Kirsten Schmidt, Head of Sector Rapid Response for Europe, Asia and the Americas at the Foreign Policy Instrument at the European Commission. And last but not least, Michael Newton, Head of Region for Ukraine from the HALO Trust. Um, I would like to start um, by giving, uh, by giving um, the floor to you, uh, Chiyuki, so you can tell us a bit about the shared um, priorities and challenges in Japan, um, EU uh, EU cooperation and security um, challenges as well. So I'll give you the floor, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and may I thank you for your uh, invitation. I am Chiyuki Aoi. <laughs> My last name is pronounced that way. And I'm Professor at International Security, but currently I am directing a strategic communications research and education unit at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo with the support of actually a CIWA program of the European Union. Therefore, I'm very much uh, grateful for uh, EU support. Um, today I am asked to actually provide you uh, with a background of uh, how a values-driven strategy of Japan coincides with EU's interests and so on, and uh, uh, explore the uh, common uh, direction that EU and Japan could take with regard to supporting Ukraine. Um, so my, my focus is rather broad than demining itself, on which I'm not an expert, but I'm very happy to explain you the background and the importance of values that Japan attaches in its diplomacy. So Japan has been pursuing a value-driven st strategy in the past 20 years and more intensively in the last decade or so. And values-driven strategy is a key, uh, values actually are the key foreign policy pillar of Japan. And Japan would like to promote fundamental liberal values of the international system through broader international cooperation with broader range of uh, actors in the world and of which of, of course eu is the uh, one of the most important partners um particularly uh in terms of concrete policy uh those were promoted particularly uh since the mid 2000s and more intensively after the second uh 
Shinzo Abe administration starting in 2012. So one of the earliest uh, uh, policy uh, priorities in that would be Arch of Freedom and Prosperity uh, proposed in 2006 by the Foreign Minister of First Abe administration, which covered actually a very broad area uh, ranging from uh, the Baltics to Eastern Europe, Central Asia to Southeast Asia to, to where it is now covered by Indo-Pacific region. Uh, Japan was one of the architects of the idea of Indo-Pacific. Uh, this was the idea uh, announced by Prime Minister Abe in his speech uh, in 2007 in the Indian Parliament, uh, in which he proposed the sort of the uh, closer union of two democracies in Asia, uh, relying on the uh, strong identity of both India and uh, Japan. Uh, the identity of democratic uh, nations, and he also proposed closer ties, uh, collaboration between India and Japan. And actually, um, free and open Indo-Pacific and also other, other uh, partnerships like Quad uh, are actually very important achievements for uh, both, I would say, both Japan and India. Uh, to have India co collaborating in such uh, partnerships is actually uh, quite significant and it's it is our achievement of the uh, values driven strategy promoted by uh japan around that time and in uh values are very important in promoting japan's policy of free and open in the pacific and also in 2022 japan uh revised the national security strategy of japan and this document mentions values 17 times and it actually declares that is, uh, it, it, it remains one of the core pillars of Japan's um, strategy uh, to promote uh, free and open uh, international order is globally, but especially in Indo-Pacific region. So that's declared as one of the uh, core uh, purpose of Japan's strategy in that document. And the current Kishida administration has just issued a new plan for a free and open Indo-Pacific in which he proposes that we move from the fundamental principles or which uh, which is uh, broadly now understood and shared globally among like-minded countries, uh, move from those principles to actual policies. Uh, that's what he proposed. Um, actually, the closer EU-Japan relations was an extension of that values-driven policy uh, that Japan has been pursuing in the last uh, 20 or so years. And the uh, idea of free and op open Indo-Pacific was first supported by the Quad, US, Australia, and India. And then uh, soon it was shared, supported by ASEAN, which published ASEAN Outlook for Indo-Pacific, and eventually uh, by the EU. And France, Germany, the Netherlands, and EU, these countries each issued their own Indo-Pacific strategies, which reflect their own foreign policy priorities. But these actually indicate that Indo-Pacific has become now the center of geostrategic uh, geo um, competition and cooperation, both. And uh, there is a recognition that Indo-Pacific is going to be the geostrategic geo center of gravity in the coming century. So I think uh, um, everyone agrees for to about the importance of Indo-Pacific. But for Japan, in many ways, the security in Indo-Pacific and the EU is interdependent and we we consider those to be connected because ultimately it is a global task to ensure that fundamental freedom is liberal values uh, is ensured globally and for that i think eu and japan's collaboration actually remains the linchpin for the realization of those strategic visions based upon values and actually ukraine represents the foremost of our common policy uh, Preferences, I think, uh, and I think uh, there may be a slightly different, uh, slight differences in priorities when we discuss European security and you know Indo-Pacific security. Those things are inevitable. But I think with regard to Ukraine, I think that it was easier for uh, both EU and Japan to find common interests in actually supporting Ukraine. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Japan immediately declared Russia's invasion to be an abhorrent breach of international law. And Japan's policy in support of Ukraine 
uh, actually represented a shift from the previous uh, stance where Japan had to balance the uh, uh, territorial disputes with the you know your uh, negotiation over territorial disputes with uh, Russia. But now I think that uh, Japan's policy has uh, dramatically changed, and currently Japan strongly supports Ukraine on the recognition that. Uh, Ukraine may be the East Asia tomorrow. That's the, that's the key phrase that the Japanese government uses. Um, and I think, uh, and hence, Japan still con continues to view that European and Indo-Pacific security is linked, and uh, Ukraine is very much an uh, um, example of that. Of that. Um, and Ukraine uh, represents... Uh, um, uh, Ukraine is a major common interest for both EU and Japan, although in terms of developing common project, I think it's still in the early phase. Uh, in uh, May 2023, Japan led G7 summit in, in Hiroshima to support strongly Ukraine, and, it, and Japan still today continues to uh, maintain the international support continues to uh, support uh, maintain the international support for Ukraine, uh, and also Japan is committed to increasing the cost to Russia and to those third countries who are uh, supporting Russia's war effort. And in terms of assistance to Ukraine, those data is broad broadly available. But Japan has provided diplomatic, financial, humanitarian, and military support to Ukraine. And uh, in in terms of final in. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of financial assistance, there has been 7.1 billion uh, US dollars assistance to uh, electricity, mine clearance, and agriculture sector in Ukraine. And in terms of bilateral uh, grant aid, that was am that amounted to uh, 370 million US dollars. Um, and Japan provided uh, 30 million through NATO trust fund for non lethal defense equipment. So Japan supports NATO process through this. And uh, in terms of uh, materials, uh, since last March, Japanese MOD, Ministry of Defense, has provided flak jackets, protective masks, vehicles, small drones, rations, etc. And Japan has joined, importantly, uh, IT coalition and demining coalition to assist Ukraine. So it's part of uh, international coalitions to support uh, Ukraine. Um, And I think given Japan's history as a uh, economic power and also with much experience in uh, supporting war-torn societies uh, and natural disaster as a provider for natural disaster relief, it's natural for Japan to actually prioritize support for uh, post-war reconstruction uh, also for Ukraine as well. And these priority areas have already uh, uh, have already been discussed. Assistance has already begun. And those priority areas include mine clearance, debris, and contamination management. As uh, actually, I think it's critical is in it's supporting critical uh, private sector. So Japan supports multilateral investment guarantee agency support for Ukraine's reconstruction and economy trust fund, and also uh, they have, uh, the Japan launched Ukraine's investment platform in Tokyo. And uh, Japan hosts the Japan Ukraine conference for promoting promotion of economic reconstruction. Uh, I think it's uh, I think the chair also mentioned this, but I think it's going to uh, start February next year. Um, so I think uh, Japan con continues to liaise with the uh, Ukraine uh, president. When President Zelensky visited G7 last year, uh, this earlier this year, uh, his wish list, uh, priority lists, such as uh, Japan support for international support for technology to Ukraine, such as reconstruction in energy, railroads, and medicine, humanitarian assistance, uh, support for private sector, um, mine action debris to create uh, clearance livelihood reconstruction recovery of agriculture uh, uh, and industrial development strengthening democracy all these things were uh hard intently and japan wants to assist ukraine on all these uh, uh fronts and i think i'm coming to my conclusion having reviewed all these developments i think that future areas for eu japan cooperation support ukraine would uh, probably most likely to uh, to to focus on economic and reconstruction area including demining and and japan has had a past uh, uh 
comparative advantage, I'd believe, in infrastructure assistance development. So things like electricity, energy, railways, medicine, all these things that are demand, I think Japan will need to uh, prioritize. And I think there might be a lot of scope, room for EU and Japan to, uh, you know, mutually assist uh, and mutually collaborate, uh, you know, um, deconflict our areas of assistance uh, to make it effective. Agricultural development is another area, but uh, some, as someone who's working on strategic uh, communication, I think strengthening democracy is also another area that EU and Japan most likely to also think about. So, for example, you know, what is to, to think about uh, what is possible uh, to support uh, democracy in such a difficult situation in Ukraine, and, and while learning from you know each other's experience between EU and Japan, and Japan now sends a personnel to OSC a special monitoring mission to Ukraine. And uh, um, I think uh, Europe has already done a lot to assist Ukraine, uh, develop capacity or, or, or whatever in strategic communications and also countering disinformation. And uh, as Japan also develops uh, capabilities in those domains, I think there might be something to be worked out in, in, in this uh, domain, strategic communications counter disinformation. But aside from that, I think uh, we need to think through uh, our economic assistance will actually help stabilize the country now, so uh, strengthen democracy in the country. So I think uh, that area is something that we should not uh, forget and continue to think together. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This was a great opening presentation. I think you covered um, all aspects of your relations um, with Ukraine and also outlined why European security is important as well for Japan, even though you're on the other side of the world. So I'll certainly be coming back with some questions um, to you sh shortly. Um, but I want to now turn to you, um, Timothy. First of all, I want to say, you know, big congratulations um, for Ukraine opening accession negotiations um, with the EU. I think this was a fabulous news um, at the end of the week something we all hoped would happen. Um, but now I want to give you the floor and start with asking you, I mean, for Ukraine, how important um, is, is um, Japan um, as a partner? And how do you see or where do you see the opportunities for further um, developing ties with Japan? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I would like to start by indeed acknowledging that um, this is good news that the EU has opened or has voted uh, to formally open the negotiations with the EU um, uh, for the EU accession. Uh, and it took a little bit of gimmicks uh, to get um, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban to walk out of the room. That's clearly not a your formal procedural, um, but rather a kind of life hack approach. Uh, and of course, there is a question how robust that is going down uh, to the future, uh, this kind of approaches. And it also, um, it also underscores the challenges, the standard uh, peacetime procedures, uh, democratic, uh, fully inclusive uh, um, uh, rules uh, create for the environments where um, things become um, difficult and challenging. Um, unfortunately, Ukraine has not uh, gotten uh, the EU uh, Ukraine facility support, $55 billion approved. Uh, Hungary has vetoed it. Um, we are hoping um, this veto will be overcome um, in, in the future, in the coming months. However, uh, that probably will mean a substantive payout to Hungary. So the cost of uh, direct cost of uh, supporting Ukraine monetarily, monetarily increases. So in, in that sense, uh, all, uh, all support from other countries, specifically from Japan, um, is, is becoming, uh, has always been critical, but it's becoming even more important. Similar situation we're facing is in the United States, where Ukraine has become um, essentially a victim of domestic politics between Republicans and Democrats. Um, and the uh, impasse, the inability to support Ukraine, and actually lack of understanding the, uh, of the 
the way forward for Ukraine or the complexity of the war or the geopolitical consequences of uh, uh, emboldening and strengthening Russia um, is, is lost on, on some of the um, politicians and analysts in, in Washington. And that's, that's in, in fact, is, is uh, scary. Uh, uh, Russia just, uh, or Russian President uh, Putin just uh, had a conference where he reiterated his ambition uh, to achieve his objectives in Ukraine. Uh, he actually explicitly dismissed uh, an opportunity for any kind of negotiations. Um, and he said that they will continue until they achieve the very same goals that they put uh, forward uh, in the beginning of the invasion. And, you know, he was pretty clear that uh, uh, his goal is to achieve uh, uh, the inability of Ukraine to be sovereign and to protect itself militarily. And also to disconnect Ukraine from the support of the rest of the world. I mean, he phrased it in, in terms of... Uh, uh, lack of the ability to uh, protect itself militarily and uh, total neutrality where no country provides an allied support to Ukraine. So, so you know, Japan uh, being a, uh, a critical and committed supporter during this time, is, it's a sign of solidarity. It's a sign of, you know, it's a sign that um, the world can get things right. And it's a sign uh, that Russia can be held accountable. That's a broader context in which we operate. And also this uh, this uh, context, uh, there's no no sign of any kind of de-escalation. Uh, Putin uh, recently, well, yesterday or the day before yesterday, gave a lengthy interview about Finland, uh, referred to ambitions uh, and territorial disputes in the 40s and the Finland war, uh, Russian-Finland war. And actually he talked about, uh, issued some threats to Finland for joining NATO. Uh, and announced the uh, creation of a military district uh, focused specifically um, towards Finland. So, um, the you know, if we add to this uh, the situation in Israel and Gaza, if we add uh, to this uh, situation elsewhere, we see that the world is becoming a much hotter place. So all the effort uh, against maintaining the resilience of Ukraine, um, maintaining the economy, um, supplying and helping Ukraine with tools, uh, equipment and skills to be able to demine, um, to, to be able to bring economy in the occupied territories to the uh, environment in which people can function. Uh, kids can walk to schools without parents freaking out that they will get blown up. Farmers can uh, um, plant uh, uh, vegetables and, uh, uh, and grains and harvest them freely without being blown up. Um, and uh, uh, and and simply businesses can work. Uh, this is this is critical. And also your solidarity also provides uh, support. Your recent uh, announcements of the billion dollar support for recovery and the mining and uh, uh, economy of Ukraine is an extremely welcome sign in these challenging times uh, for Ukraine. So so I'm, I'm I'm as a citizen of Ukraine, I'm extremely grateful to you that you you do the right thing. Uh, the, the right thing by what, what humans should be doing, uh, what people should be doing, not just politically, but uh, on, on the individual level. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have felt your support through these two years of war, um, uh, throughout of it, and in a very, very strong way. So it has not just a financial, but also a psychological uh, uh, component to it. And uh, often it's a blind spot how important this sign of solidarity and, and political support is for Ukraine during this time. If we talk specifically about the mining, there's of course uh, this number of up to 30% of land potentially contaminated. In reality, of course, the numbers are smaller uh, because not everywhere there was an active combat situation or shelling or mining, uh, but potentially it's up to 30%. We have these horror stories, we hear them daily about farmers uh, being blown up, people in the occupied and freed villages being blown up, uh, children dying, uh, their parents dying. Um, this is awful and we do not want and we cannot uh, afford uh, the mining effort uh, to go on for decades. Um, so technological innovation is key. Good training is key. I recently came from a front line um, where actually Ukrainian sappers, uh, the miners, uh, got blown up. Uh, and uh, because Russia has been innovating, 
in the way they set up traps. Um, so more and more learning is needed. Uh, knowledge sharing is needed. Uh, technological innovation, regulatory innovation is needed. We have to create sandbox. We have to create environments in which people can um, e experiment, test, uh, share knowledge, um, and get financing for both training and technological uh, development uh, and putting this knowledge in place uh, because it's going to be a um, much larger effort than we are usually, usually used to it and much more complex effort. Uh, because of the strategic na nature of the situation. Uh, there's also a, a, um, a, an important aspect of the uh, creation of databases uh, where the minefields are, and also um, getting uh, Ukrainian military engaged in such a way that uh, um, they reveal information about which areas are safe from their perspective uh, without jeopardizing any national security interests. Um, so these are really big challenges because we are demining in the active uh, war time period. Uh, and while we are demining, uh, both sides are putting new mines in the fields. Uh, that, uh, that is an additional complication that many people um, do not understand. That happens especially at the border in Chernigov, Sumy, Kharkiv, Kherson, uh, actually all across the contact line. Um, so, so we need to find a way to demine and maintain safety and inform people and have uh, a, a much more emphasis on technological innovation, uh, autonomous uh, um, demining without humans present to save lives. Um, and uh, Japan is, is being a leader here. Um, and um, every time I speak to the government, uh, the government is, uh, is excited and uh, grateful um to japan government officials and to japan citizens um, um and i just spoke earlier this morning uh to the vice prime minister of economy sverdenko and mentioned that i will be talking at the conference and she sends her regards and things thank you very much thank you uh timothy i mean what you explained about the the extent of of landmines um, in Ukraine, I mean, it's horrifying, and we also know they're not just on the land; they're also um, in the sea as well. That has um, that also has an impact for shipping, um, etc. But I hope we'll have the time for me to come back with some additional questions shortly. Um, and just to the audience, you can ask your question either by um, clicking on the hand icon um, and or typing it into the chat box. So you can either do it physically or by writing. So please do already get your questions um, prepared. We want you to be part of this discussion. Um, so now I want to turn to um, EU Kirsten Schmidt um, to hear the perspective from the EU. Um, it would be great to hear um, from your side, what are the actual um, strategies and assistance for demining um, in Ukraine, um, but also where are the EU and Japan already cooperating and where do you see opportunities um, for further working together I mean, in reconstruction, et cetera, in, in the future? Thanks, thanks a lot, Amanda, and and also Tiko and um, uh, and Timothy for uh, for your points before. Um, uh, of course, there there were quite some very um, rich points, uh, as you also said, to Amanda and Timothy's speech, and I think it's a good kind of cue to to my presentation, which I wanted to start with a couple of numbers. Indeed, uh, potentially over a third of territory um suspected or at risk of uh of uh mines and explosives at the moment um but also an estimate that about that that 16 sorry 16 million uh, uh um, that, that are uh suspected may have risk of mine or explosive contamination but also an estimated 3.5 million um, that uh, could be released uh, for use, um, for safe use, uh, purely through initial assessments and non-technical surveys. Um, so before using any equipment, which is, of course, where things take longest and are most um, uh, financially uh, and also human resource in intensive. Um, then the, the, there's an estimate that about 2.5 million uh, will require technical survey 
uh, that then really implies uh, more human resources, uh, more technical appliances. Uh, as Timothy pointed out, uh, innovation will be super important. And then the estimate is that only about 0 0.8 million will require of land will be will require clearance. So I, I think these numbers are hugely important to to see because they show that by being smart, Ukraine can move fast in terms of, of enabling land uh, to be used safely as quickly as possible. I wanted to just um, uh, uh, tell you a few other figures that I found telling. There have recently been estimates. Um, uh, again, there, there was an assessment in Kharkiv of 250,000 fields uh, that are more than 40 kilometers from the front line. And within these 250,000 fields, 450,000 craters uh, were found. Uh, so I think that that illustrates also um, uh, not only are there, you know, people that die or are uh, uh, mutilated uh, for life in those fields, and that obviously um, creates a humongous fear, um, but but also there there is about 25% of the land that is currently not cultivated where there are uh, there is direct evidence also of, of, of mines and explosives in, 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 in many of these areas. So um, this is why, uh, from an EU perspective, we really put a lot of emphasis on the part of the initial assessments if there's no evidence of mines um, uh, to, to only provide some confidence building measures so that farmers can put this land back into use as quickly as possible. And that, of course, is also uh, uh, what uh, the Ministry of Economy uh, and uh, First Deputy Prime Minister uh, Sriyodenko put a lot of emphasis on. Um, because it is crucial for economic recovery. Um, uh, so maybe uh, just very briefly, because before I go further into the question of, uh, of strategic approach uh, in terms of what the EU is, is doing uh, in this regard. Um, uh, so we have uh, four uh, response axes, I would say. Um, we provide 26 million euros at the moment uh, for the provision of equipment uh, to, 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 to state mine action operators. Um, for the time being, this is uh, uh, rather standard equipment, i.e. big, uh, heavy uh, mechanic demining machines, all the way down to personal protective equipment for demining teams, uh, uh, transport for demining teams, uh, radio communication for demining teams. Um, so really basic stuff for them to be able to do their survey activities um, and also their, their actual clearance activities. We also uh, train and deliver dogs and uh, provide uh, drones for, for area survey. Um, then the, the, the second area where we uh, provide support is through the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Again, this is equipment focused. And of course, uh, I think uh, uh, the audience uh, and, and panel, other panel, panel members are aware uh, this is a mechanism that allows member states to um, uh, donate equipment. And at the moment, uh, we have about 4.3 million worth of equipment delivered uh, through donations from member states uh, and also some specific training. Amanda, you mentioned it uh, for under uh, water mine, action, mine clearance, uh, which uh, specifically focuses on lakes and rivers. In fact, um, yes, for waterway navigation, but also because, of course, uh, uh, lakes, um, people swim in, in the summer, uh, rivers, uh, they they expand and uh, there, there may be flooding. That means that uh, mines are uh, displaced. It's very, the risk is very difficult to manage, therefore. Um, 
And then, of course, uh, uh, we also work, we continue to work with uh, third, what we call third party operators. Um, that means uh, NGOs active in the mine action sector and we work a lot with HALO. Uh, Michael will speak later, so I'm not going to, to go to that, but I want to finally manage the fourth pillar of EU support to Ukraine. And that is really in the governance area. Um, that, uh, um, in, includes in particular uh, that we directly finance um, uh, Ukrainian experts that work in the newly set up or currently overhauled uh, Ukrainian um, mine action governance system. And uh, at the moment, we have a specific focus on the um, uh, Center for Humanitarian Bee Mining under the Ministry of Economy. Uh, which which is a new center uh, which brings together the different strands of, of of mine action we have and links them up in particular importantly to to econ economic recovery and 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 reconstruction um so here uh, uh, is also the point where I can really illustrate um how closely we work also with with Japan on this I mean I will come back to further cooperation because we do cooperate closely with them but I think it it is, it is uh, an illustration of how closely we work together with the Ukrainian government on um, uh, supporting them to get this smart strategy that I mentioned at the start uh, uh, right and be able to implement it effectively that both Japan and the EU are permanently represented uh, on the advisory board for the uh, humanitarian demining center under the Ministry of Economy. We are there the only donors um, uh, other than uh, Canada and, and Croatia. So it, it, it shows you it, it is a rather small group um, uh, where, where we really look at those issues and also uh, try to support the Ministry of Economy to, to, to uh, who was in the auspices of developing the National Mine Action Strategy. First of all, it will be adopted, we believe, within the next weeks. Um, uh, and will then also, of course, be in the lead of overseeing the, the implementation of this National Mine Action, action Strategy. Um, and here I just wanted to also go back to one of the things that Timothy said, because, um, of course, it is, it is uh, really important to recognize that mine contamination is ongoing. Um, and, and here again, we believe that a smart strategy uh, uh, is hugely important to be able to continuously um, put land that is potentially at risk but can relatively easily be proven not to be dangerous to put that back into use rapidly uh, so that uh, there's not a, a growing amount of land that is is not in use and it is unfortunately um, uh, for now a very um, big ambition uh, to, to hope that the land can be cleared in, in less than decades. But what is a very realistic ambition is to reduce the risk of mines to civilian population and the impact of mines on economic recovery and reconstruction um, uh, to manageable sizes a lot more rapidly than has been the case in, in, in other theatres. Um, so I think now I just wanted to briefly close by, uh, 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 because you asked me specifically also on, on cooperation with Japan in, or, or let's say more concrete areas of cooperation with Japan, just wanted to point out that, uh, of course, uh, Japan has been um, the chair of the G7 group now um, uh, and, and is until the end of the year. And in that uh, respect, Japan is also playing a very important role uh, uh, in, in, in coordination and we've been working very closely with the embassy uh, of Japan in, 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 in Kiev over the past uh, uh, year. But I think this cooperation will also continue because of the importance of Japan and the EU in the mine action sector. Um, we coordinate also on the delivery of equipment uh, uh, to make sure that what we deliver is complementary. Um, and we have been the first donors together with Japan after uh, the deoccupation of Bucha um, uh, to come in uh, with debris removal. And only last week, together with Japan, we have opened uh, uh, activities on this in, in Chernihiv uh, as well. 
Um, so I think overall we can say this is a, 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 a cooperation we really um, uh, appreciate uh, from the EU side and, and uh, we are sure to, to, to look to continue. Um, other important actors, uh, uh, of course, we, we work with and here again, I think we are fully in tune with Japan. Um, is uh, uh, the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining, uh, which which is is really has a has a very positive and, and very central role in Ukraine on everything that is linked to uh, uh, getting supporting the government's ambition to get the system in place that can enable a rapid um, uh, action on in the demining sector. Um, but also, of course, the UN, uh, which is very vocal, and in particular UNDP, but also WFP, which is very vocal to its resident coordinator in, in Ukraine, uh, Denise Brown, a uh, very important interlocutor for us. Um, uh, and and then the upcoming presidency by, by Italy, Italy in, in G7 is also something we are looking towards, as well as a continuing informal coordination with our member states on mine action in Ukraine, uh, uh, whereby we exchange uh, lessons learned and experiences and also, of course, try to, to target um, our our support in a, in a, in a complementary way. Um, NGOs remain very important, but I've already said it before. Uh, I will I will not go into this because I know that uh, uh, Michael is going to speak. Um, just I think what I would like to end on, also having spoken about the different important interlocutors and the third party operators, mainly NGOs, uh, what we are as a EU um, trying to promote and and have a dialogue on is that uh, national mine action in Ukraine is 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 made of one mold. Uh, so there may be many actors. The important uh, importance is that we have a clear understanding uh, uh, of where the priorities are and how we can support uh, uh, the Ukrainian authorities in terms of implementing their national mine action strategy. Thank you, Amanda. Back over to you. Thank you again for a very comprehensive overview of what the, the EU um, is doing. And it's good to see that the EU has so many important ongoing um, initiatives related to this, um, I mean, this this huge challenge. Uh, you're doing very Im important work. Um, but I want to turn now to, to Michael, last but not least. Welcome back. Uh, it's not the first time we had Halo um, in the EPC. It's always a pleasure to, to hear how your work in uh, Ukraine is progressing and the important work that Halo Trust does uh, in Ukraine on, on mining and how you're working um, with other partners um, in Ukraine, both with the Ukrainian government, but with other NGOs, etc. So I give the floor to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Amanda. Nice to see you all again. Um, can I just do a, a quick sound and video check? Can you hear me all right? I think my, my internet's a bit ropey. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. That's good. Okay, great. Well, um, I, I can only add a bit of detail to what we've already heard from, from Timothy and, and from, from Joe. I think um, just a bit of background. Halo's been present in Ukraine since, since 2015. Um, working alongside other partners such as, as FSD and, and DDG now, uh, Danish Refugee Council. Post-invasion, um, we moved all of our people from Kramatorsk um, in the east out to, to Kiev, and we've expanded from there. So from a low of 200 people post-invasion up to just shy of 1,200 people. Um, now, 29% of whom um, are women. And I think that's an especially important point given the way the, the direction of the conflict is going, the challenges that are present around conscription, um, the recruitment of women is something we've always promoted globally, but in Ukraine for us and for our, um, our colleagues across other organizations, um, it's actually a, a material operational necessity. So um, the, the recruitment of women for us is, a, is an absolute tr a strategic um, priority. But in terms of the, the contamination, I mean, we've already, we've already touched on this. And the only thing I would add is is that while um while the the number of, of square kilometers i think the, the official number is about one hundred seventy four thousand square kilometers which is just a cataclysmic and mind-bending number when you consider that afghanistan at its height was about two thousand square kilometers it really just shows you the, the extent of the contamination but a case study that halo did or other piece of work that halo did looking at a rapid assessment of suspected contaminated land we believe, and I think our colleagues in UNDP and, and WFP and GICHD would also concur with this, is that approximately 
uh, up to 10% of that number is, 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 is actually contaminated with landmines. But that's still, that's still a huge number and dwarfs anything that we've seen so far in, in our history. And I think to, to, Timoth to Timothy's point, I think that the worst case scenario for Ukraine in terms of um, it, where the, the, the military picture moves into one that is humanitarian and one that is, that is economic is that we end up with a situation whereby we know that the Russians have laid millions of landmines across approximately a thousand kilometers of front line. The, the Ukrainian military is now in a position where they are li li likely going to have to do the same. And this, we are now facing a scenario where both sides are laying millions of landmines to stop the other from, from encroaching on their territory um, or moving from one side to the other. And we face a scenario where we're looking at a, a North-South Korea divide, um, which will you know, have pretty, pretty dire consequences. So, you know, we need to be, and the world needs to be ready for that and to make sure that that doesn't happen. But otherwise, in terms of um, what we've done, I mean, we've, um, since the 24th of February last year, we've surveyed over 400 minefields and over 17 million square meters. So what's that? 17,000 hectares um, of land. Um, and I think in terms of what's needed to best promote the, the scalability of, of, of mine action in Ukraine, operationally at least, we've already talked about non-technical survey um, and my colleagues and I were at the Kiev School of, School of Economics in February of this year, talking about um, you know non-technical survey in, in the space of, of innovation. We forget that innovation isn't just about technology; it's about process as well. And with non-technical survey, when you tie that into the need to develop, as we've, as we've already touched on, a national strategy in Ukraine, um, you know the, the rapid damage needs assessment number three is already being drafted, and we're feeding into that. We also need to look at national mine action standards as well at the at the operational level and how that ties into the rapid release um, of of land or rather the development of confidence building measures um, around land that's suspect, suspected of being contaminated to rapidly get it back into productive use now the issue with non-technical survey in a, in a policy sense in ukraine is that up to this up to this point we have never been able to or operators have ne never been able to do what we call cancellation so you have so in terms of land release in, in mine action um one of the, the activities you can, you can carry out is cancellation that's whereby you go and carry out non-technical survey on land um but then following a, a, a process you realize that there's actually there's nothing there and you can cancel it and you can essentially um, release that land but that process hasn't existed in ukraine it's currently now being developed so that will be a game changer if we're allowed to do that but these things take take time so the the rapid assessment of suspected land without doing that uh, without carrying out full non-technical survey but then using confidence building measures to release that in in line with with um the landowners which is in the local government's wishes is is going to be the best way to get land into back into productive use quickly and of course as we've already highlighted if you can identify where contamination is with a degree with a degree of probability and certainty you can also identify where it's not so getting those two things aligned is going to be absolutely key. So in terms of our response um, since last year, um, we've now got a number of locations um, around Ukraine, most of in Brovary and, and Kiev, also down in Mykolaiv and Kherson and out in Kharkiv um, as well. Um, we've developed a, an expeditionary concept whereby we want to be, and it's not just us, I think it's a sector-wide thing. We need to be on the front foot and matching our our Ukrainian colleagues' appetites, both in terms of um, the state of emergency services and the military as well, to get to areas that are most contaminated quickly and alleviate the humanitarian burden. But I think one of our key, one of our key challenges um, in Halo and those for our, for our fellow operators is that so many villages and towns, as, as we're seeing as, as we speak along the front lines, um, are, are either have been utterly destroyed or, or are in the process of being systematically reduced by the Russians and a key challenge for operators such as us where we have you know 1200 people more by the end of the year we want to be getting them out uh, onto a onto a more forward leaning um, footing into these areas is we need to be able to provide accommodation we need to be able to provide infrastructure food water electricity and so on and so forth and in many places along the front line that simply doesn't exist so we're in the process of developing an expeditionary concept whereby we're able to do that and essentially import and build um, temporary accommodation in order to get it where we need to be um, as quickly um, as possible. 
Um, and in terms of operational efficiency, I've already mentioned the need for uh, for non technical survey and the, and the need for further innovation in terms of the process. And we're like I mentioned, we're already feeding into the um, the development of the national mine action strategy. And I think it's one of those um, one of the successes we've had this year. And it's in no small part thanks to the, the lobbying and, and advocacy from our donors, um, like Japan, like the EU, is that we've been granted permission. Um, I'm the, one of the first of our operators involved in a pilot project with the Ukrainian MOD. We've been granted permission now to use explosives to destroy mines where we find them. And, and that's going to be an absolute game changer, not just for us, but this, for the sector as, as, as a whole. Because up to this point, we haven't been able to, to use explosives because the use of explosives is, is buried in about 117 different pieces of legislation. Um, up to this point, when we've been finding um, mines or explosive items, and we've found over 10,000 um, in the past year, of, of a mixture of varieties, we've had to wait for the state of emergency services to come and do it for us. Now they're as, as overstretched and as busy as they are, we want to be able to promote efficiency by destroying an item in situ where we find it. So we've been grant, granted the permission to do that and that will be an absolute game changer for us and really increase productivity. I'm sure many other operators will, will follow in our footsteps and we hope that that will be rolled out um, more broadly. Otherwise, um, one thing we've been lobbying for heavily over the past um, two years is to use armoured mechanical assets um, for clearance. Now we know that many of our fellow operators and, and, and operators in general are using remote assets such as flails and tillers, um, but we want to be able to use armoured um, mechanical assets with people inside them because it has a greater degree um, of accuracy and you're able to move more, um, more land, not just hammer it. So um, we're going through that process at the moment, that's a key strategic goal for us um, next year. And only a couple of weeks ago, we were granted accreditation for the use of remote mechanical assets, um, which again is an absolute game changer. We really hope we'll lead on to, to bigger and better things next year. In terms of recovery and reconstruction, I think it's um, in terms of that, that bigger picture that we've already we've already discussed, it's I, I think it, it's it's very noticeable that the language around post-conflict reconstruction and recovery has really taken a, a significant dip since the the high of, of discussions around the Ukraine recovery conference in London early in the summer. We've kind of followed this bell curve over the year. It started out fairly quietly and now it grew to this through this massive crescendo over the summer and now it's it's died back down again. And I think it's really important that we keep talking about about mine clearance um and and and, and the, the removal of landmines in the broader context of a recovery and reconstruction, not just removal of, of landmines in and of themselves. And as we look ahead to to what a, a post the post-war Ukraine looks like, um, as I mentioned at the at the beginning, you know the, the recruitment of women for us is, is an absolute priority. I want us to be able to be a, a sustainable recruiter and a sustainable employer of um, demobilized and, and wounded veterans as well. There are going to be over a million soldiers that need jobs in a post-conflict environment, not um, notwithstanding all the the problems and challenges that come with a a country in an immediately post-conflict setting. So we need to be better positioned to to enable employment opportunities um, at scale. Um, and in terms of looking ahead, I, the, the need for that long term planning hasn't um, hasn't gone away, as we as we mentioned, as as, as Timothy um, and my, my colleagues have, have already mentioned, the Minister of Economy's target of releasing and returning eighty percent of potentially contaminated land to productive use over the next ten years. It can be met. It is highly ambitious, but it can be met with the right combination of resources, um, I think flexibility and, and, and thinking. And innovation development is, is absolutely key to, to achieving this. Um, now we know that under um, the RDNA2, there was released in quarter one last year, about 10% of the total reconstruction costs would be clearing landmines and broader demining efforts. I think it was 74 billion euros. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what RDNA3 says when that comes out um, earlier next year. But what's needed, and I've kept on hammering this over the past past two years, is the three buzzwords of, of flexibility in terms of in terms of funding and where it's allocated, sustainability of that funding, and scalability to better enable the Ukrainian government and, and NGOs like Halo and our colleagues to, to rapidly ramp up and get helped where it's needed um, as quickly as possible. And it only leaves me to say um, to, to thank our, our Japanese colleagues um, for their engagement, not just in Ukraine, but with Halo more broadly. So a couple of words on that. Um, so globally, Halo has received Japanese funding in Cambodia and Angola 
and currently in Sri Lanka and Somalia using UN Mine Action Services as the as the back donor. And as always, we're incredibly grateful for that for that support. Um, and in Ukraine, Halo currently receives funding from the uh, Japanese eye NGO um, of AAR Japan. That's the Association for, for Aid um, and Relief. And of course, Japan participates in the Demining Coalition together with many of the EU member states. And most of Japan's ODA is, is bilateral, bilateral, excuse me, to, to Ukraine. Otherwise, um, that's all I have to say. That's a really rapid canter through, but thank you very much for, for listening. I'm afraid that we've actually run out of time. We should have actually made the event longer, maybe one and a half hours, but I think one hour is, is too too short. And I think to have any sort of discussion on, on Ukraine, such as the importance. But I'd like to thank uh, all of you for joining us this morning. And so so early or so late, uh, um, depending on where we are in the world, for coming and give us your excellent insights to hearing what you're doing um, what more needs to be done and where the opportunities are for Japan um, and the EU to work together, indeed with other like-minded parties, um, because there's plenty of areas where we can all work together to help Ukraine, to help Ukraine win, win the war, um, and then reconstruct this beautiful country. Um, so thank you all. I wish you a great start to this week um, and then a great holiday season because we're actually nearly there. So have a wonderful day and thanks to all of you. Bye-bye.